third annual Edith Fox King Lecture at San Antonio College. The lecture series honors Edith Fox King, who taught journalism and advised publications at this college from 1958 to 1968. King was a pioneer in scholastic journalism and a nationally recognized speaker at high school and college conferences. Since its beginning in 1978, the series has featured 18 speakers who were Pulitzer Prize winners in photojournalism, reporting, editorial writing, and editorial cartooning. We want to recognize special guests and friends of the journalism photography department this evening. Dr. Robert Ziegler, who is the vice president of our college, D. Luciano Salinas, and John Hammond of Public Relations.
for an editorial, something about the board bickering. Something like that. <laughs> and Vincent Davis. Thank you. 
find anybody to help me, so everyone's <laughs> volunteering here at the last second. We spend much of our time today in computers, so this is our exercise for the evening. We'll have students keep walking up to <laughs> Um, okay, we have two uh, Society of Professional Journalists um, winners. Um, the first goes to Laura Jesse. Oh, and while Miss Jesse is up here, I should announce that she's also <coughs> receiving a Santana Light Endowment Scholarship. Our second Society of Professional Journalist Scholarship goes to Moses Smith. The next category of scholarships is the Janelle MacArthur Endowment. Our first goes to Jason Ramos, who was absent a few minutes ago, but I saw him outside. I know he's around here somewhere. He's just hiding. Our second goes to Sean Morris. Our third goes to Mark Flatt. Also receiving a Janelle MacArthur Endowment Scholarship is Josie Garcia. Okay, while she works her way up here. Jo um, Josie is also receiving a very spe special scholarship to this department. She is also our recipient for the fall semester of the um, W.B. Doherty Memorial Scholarship presented by the Friends of Journalism. And our final Janelle MacArthur Endowment Scholarship goes to James Tomlinson, who Ray could not be with us this evening. Our next category is the San Antonio Light Endowment Scholarship one very special to me as a refugee of the San Antonio Light when they closed, but I think I landed in a pretty good place. Our uh, first uh, goes to Tiffany Chesterman. Uh -huh. um, the second San Antonio Light Endowment Scholarship goes to Michael Harrell. Also receiving a Light Scholarship is Cynthia Sparza. Tonight is Rodolfo Gonzalez, a photojournalist with the Rocky Mountain News. 
He um, was, you know, he was very special to us here since he was a student here, um, 1987 to 1989. He served on staff, I guess, three semesters as a photographer and his fourth semester as a um, photo editor. Well, I was editor of the uh, Ranger. Uh, so we go back a long way. It's been a lot of fun watching his uh, development and progress in his career. Uh, I have always had a lot of faith in him. He used to come in each morning to the newsroom, sit down at my desk and say, Irene, let's go to Nicaragua. <laughs> or the next week it'd be, Irene, let's go to Afghanistan. Wherever anything in the world was going on, Rudy knew about it and he wanted to be in the middle of it. I can't say that I have always agreed with his method of getting to where he is today, but it's been interesting to watch and um, we're very proud of him. Um, he started his professional career at the San Antonio Light as an intern. He went on to um, Shreveport, sorry I can't remember the name of your paper there. Uh, worked at the Fort Worth Star Telegram, Providence Journal Bulletin, before joining the Rocky Mountain News in 1999. He uh, was part of the staff that won for the April 20th, 1999 shootings at, at uh, Columbine High School. Um, I have to tell you that he visited us last summer, brought with him some of his work that he um, shared with us, um, particularly his trip to Sudan, um, that some of you may have seen in the Ranger. Um, I think it was our April 7th issue, the next one's in the department, I said you'd like to see it. Um, and told us then that he didn't include any <coughs> of the photos from Columbine in his portfolio because he didn't care to be remembered for that. So it's a um, somewhat bittersweet award, uh, but well deserved. So I give you Rodolfo Gonzalez. Okay, let's see, this was working earlier. 
Okay. Want to stand by? So long. Um,
hard to follow that. Um, I wasn't too sure what exactly I, I wanted to say in the process of, of, of showing this work. I, you, know, the, you know, the cliche, unfortunately, I don't even think is, is nearly what uh, I think it deservedly is. You know, picture's worth a thousand words. I, I think it goes beyond that. I think, you know, how, how do you find words for feelings and emotions? It's impossible. For me, it is. It is now. Um, the, the work we did um, was, I, I, again, we, as a staff, we, we, we struggled through an incredible amount of grief in, in just a few days and continued for the next year, following something like this through our, uh, in our community, for the community. And, and I think, you know, uh, the images we made, we struggled to make on a daily basis. I think the first day, I think all of us um, responded um, sort of like the community and law enforcement. It was, it was purely uh, adrenaline, purely uh, shock, which, which uh, unfortunately turned uh, the next few days following into uh, pure emotions. You know, uh, there was uh, there wasn't a moment in our photo lab that uh, somebody wasn't crying at one end of the light table. Um, uh, there there wasn't a day that I didn't go by um, where I wasn't uh, literally trying to focus through my own tears. Uh, <laughs> thank goodness autofocus has come a long way. Um, but but at the same time, it, it's not nearly. Um, it's not, uh, it's obviously not nearly the beginning of, or, or it couldn't even begin to touch um, on the pain and suffering that the, the family and the students and the community as a whole went through that day and the days that followed. I, th I think what we experienced as professionalists, as professionals, as professionals um, was, was only a small fraction of that. And, and, and I think of that and I, and I try to find strength in that and, and, and do my job and, and with the help of a lot of people, uh, a lot of other photographers, a lot of family members, my mom, my, my brother, um, you know, find strength through them and courage through them, and friends that just say what you do uh, will one day be looked at uh, and, and earmarked as, as not so much a piece of work but almost like a study. Uh, almost as, as though, I mean, the witnesses that we are and the documenting that we do, um, it, you know, it, it's, it's something that, that cannot be redone in the future or not, cannot be looked at in the future and said, boy, I wish we could look back at this again uh, and, and learn and grow. And, and I hope, and, and what has gotten me through this horrific year uh, is is the this, this strength I find in my friends and my family and other professionals that say, you know what, Th these images are going to mean more in the future to the families, survivors, and to the community, and to the professionals that, that, that work through it uh, than, than they do now. Right now, everybody's dealing with trying to understand why. Uh, and we may not never have an answer to that, but I hope, you know, these images will bring some comfort or uh, hope for a resolution. Um, boy, let's see. Uh, I guess along those lines, I guess what I, what I was really hoping to talk about and, and didn't really know how to, to begin um, bringing a point is, is dealing with, as professional journalists and as student journalists, that um, stu as student journalists, which I hope and pray one day you, you will never have to do this assignment or assignments like this um, or experience assignments like this, but um, unfortunately um, they are a small fraction of the, uh, the jobs that we are required to do. But I think one of the things I wanted to bring attention to is the hope that um, we as journalism, whether we're instructors, uh, students, uh, well 
endowed professionals. Uh, what I'd like to bring to this is, is the acknowledgement of some of the problems that come after we cover events like this. Um, anybody recognize the term post-traumatic stress disorder? How many of us, how many of us work out? Oh, Tommy, don't raise your hand. <laughs> How, how many of us, I mean, how many of us really like to work out? I mean, I mean I'm not saying like, you know, or a gym guru or a nut, but, you know, I'd like to say, okay, you know what? You know, salad would go good with my steak. Uh, you know, I think, I think a lot of us in society um, tend to um, worry about our physical bodies. You know, especially, you know, as we get older, as students, we sort of feel more uh, invulnerable. We, we certainly, as, as we get older, we certainly start I know I've certainly started to consider my my health, my physical health. Um, the one thing in, in the one thing that we don't do, and I know I, I didn't do until now, was, was find concern or find even reasons to worry about my own mental health. Um, before this, or you know, it was sort of like, oh, this is part of the job. You know, I can just I can take care of this. I can cover, you know, a funeral one day and make the images I have to make because I'm doing my job. And then I take that and I shove it real far down. Okay, and then just shove it even further down. Uh, but I mean, I think until now, I, I, I don't think I really thought about my own mental well-being. And I think as, as student journalists, I think that's something that uh, I would be raising my hand in class and ask, how do, how do we cover these things? How do we cover funerals? Both ethically and emotionally, how do, how do we how do we separate ourselves from a camera and uh, the, the human side of that? Um, I, I've learned a long time ago. Well, actually, I thought I learned a long time ago that um, listening to other professionals say, "You know what? I get into situations like that that are very emotional, very painful to look at, and it's, for some reason I find myself behind the camera and I use the camera almost as a shield." You know, and, and they sort of are, are able to detach themselves from the scene because of that function of focus, uh, f-stops, uh, you know, composition, etc. And until recently, I, I basically have been forced to say, you know what, that's not true. I, I don't find that, for me, uh, at all, the situation I feel. I feel just the opposite. I don't feel as though. Uh, I am protected by my camera. I feel like I am, I am sort of um, anything that I see through my viewfinder, whatever lens I have, is almost a magnification, a microscope, a, tel a telescope, I guess. And when I point that camera, whether in a, in a terrible situation like Columbine or uh, at a sporting event, it certainly feels more and more like a telescope, almost you know, a, 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 a telephoto lens to one's soul who I am photographing. I mean, it, it, to me, everything outside stops with the exception of that one frame. Whatever's in that little camera frame, that's, that's what I feel now. That's what I see. That's what I hear. And, and that's what I imagine myself in. And, and that's been the hardest thing, is going from using a camera as a shield to uh, picking up a camera and, and unfortunately, feeling the pain involved in taking the image. Uh, it, it, again, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of us on the staff of 19 that have come together several times to talk about our, um, our disorders, personal uh, disorders. Um, you know, to me, uh, a lack of sleep at night, uh, a long day, um, aggravated stomach, I mean, boy, I could chalk that up, okay. Stressful day at the office, check, okay. Uh, whew, shouldn't eat that chili. Check. You know, bad, you know, all these, all these, all these uh, symptoms that, that revolve around post-traumatic stress disorder, I, I was having checks for. Not me, not me, not me, not me, not me. And, and the reality is, is, you know, I have to go back now when I sat down with other photographers and talked about it, and I'm kind of going, okay, that's me. Wait, that's me too. Okay, all of the above. You know, and it was painful because I realized, geez, I'm vulnerable. And what was even more painful for me was realizing how much more sensitive I became with the camera. And I don't know if that's good or bad. 
You know, it's kind of hard. I think everybody has to find their own, their own uh, sort of volume for sensitivity when they do their job. I, 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 I certainly don't want to preach turn it off when you pick up a camera, turn it off when you pick up a pad and a pencil. Just the opposite. I mean, turn it on until it hurts. And then turn it up just a notch more. Because, again, that's just a fraction of what the people you're interviewing or the people you're photographing have gone through. And, and if, the, you know, if that little bit more pain makes me to be a more sensitive and better photographer, hopefully more sensitive, not so much worried about better, um, you know, I, I've certainly had to decide to, t you know, endure that. <coughs> Again, it's, a, it's fractions. Um, uh, the disorders I've dealt with personally, and, you know, I don't think, you know, in, in a, being raised in a Hispanic family, I don't think we've ever spoke or, or discussed, spoke, I don't think we've ever discussed um, mental health, mental well-being. I mean, it's not any great you know, taboo subject, I th just think it never came up. I think we, you know, as a Hispanic family, I mean, we, we shared everything. And we still share everything. And we, you know, my mom was my shrink. My brother's my shrink. Well, you know, I'm my brother's shrink. Well, sometimes. <laughs> I mean, I think, you know, I think, you know, among the family, we shared a lot of information that helped us get through a lot of different things. And we do that now. And I know that specifically now, I mean, there's been a lot of things that, that I, I've gone through and I've shared with directly with my brother who who's also a professional journalist um, but to get back to the discussion of talking to counselors or shrinks or whatever terminology you want to use um, it was really difficult for me to try and decide to go see one and it took a, a lot of prodding um, from friends and family to say you know what you're not doing okay you know and I'm like what do you mean I'm not doing okay? Hey, I got you're okay. Uh, and, and you know, and, and unfor I'm sorry, I know this is, un unfortunately, um, it, it took uh, nearly 11 months for me to realize that something like this certainly had that lasting effect, and it still does. And so, I, I, you know, after my first of several sessions, um, before the anniversary that just passed this past April, um, you know, it, it's, it's all right now to say, yeah, you know, I, I, I talked to somebody about this, and I suggest that if anybody ever deals with stories, uh, hopefully not of this magnitude or, or, or any, any things like this, um, that it, it's not a taboo to go and talk to somebody. Uh, it, it's, it should be something you discuss in class. Firefighters and police officers and medical personnel, they all have counselors at the you know, call. You know, they all wear pagers, they all have um, priests, they all have uh, religious uh, icons that are there just waiting, just to talk. I think in, in journalism, I think you know, we need in class, as well as in the industry, to say, you know what, here's some numbers. If for any reason you have a problem, call this number. And, and as a student, as a student journalist, I think that you know, it should certainly be a Pop quiz. Okay, what is supposed to be? Dramatic stress disorder. I know I hated pop quizzes, but my sister usually got me through them. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I, I really think it should be something looked into. I mean, I, think, I really think it should be looked into as, as part of a curriculum. Um, I guess I should get off that soapbox, but um, any questions? I'd like to answer anything and everything. Go ahead, please. Uh, where else have you shown this show? This you know, um, I'm really nervous, so that's why I'm sort of like all over the place. Uh, but I've, I've showed this, I was asked to uh, show this similar image, uh, or the similar slideshow, um, to a press club in Ventura, California for one of their awards banquets. Um, and uh, the, predominantly when, when, we show him, when we show this show, it, it's usually to other journalism departments or other professional journalist associations, um, predominantly. One follow-up. Sure, go ahead. Sorry. Did it go with sound or just uh, picture only? Well, at, at, fir at first it was just uh, at first we, we put together on staff um, 
just pictures only. And then we decided to go, um, our director of photography, Janet Reeves, uh, heard this piece of music that is, is pretty commonly associated with the, the Holocaust. A and when she heard this music, immediately associated it with the tragedy at Columbine. And I guess she did a good job. Go ahead, please. Well, I, th I think in the first in the first day of the actual event, I, th um, I think in the total chaos, uh, I don't think I mean I don't think anybody really realized uh, we were there. Um, I think they were so, you know, uh, taken in in their own sort of little world, uh, with their own reu you know being reunited with parents, and family, and children uh, wounded. I, I don't think a lot of them paid attention for a long time that we were there. And for us, I think a lot of us um, chose to stay a little bit further back than we normally would. Um, and look, I mean, there's equipment that, that allows us to do that and try and be as intrusive as possible. And then there are other times when I, you know, for example, there's an image that I made um, that the newspaper used it and, and named it uh, United in Prayer. It's, a, it's almost like a, what they call a Hail Mary photo. You sort of raise your camera up above and shoot down and, and I, I started to shoot that image uh, with sort of a wide angle lens and then as I got closer um, instead of I mean it, it, was, it, was, it was a really bizarre scenario as I got closer and the kids were united and praying and singing hymns uh, one would sing a song the verses would stop and then another person would sing and they'd raise their hands up and, and as instead of feeling as though I was being pushed out, I found myself uh, almost sucked in. And, and, and students were basically, you know, pushing me, you know, offering, offering, you know, here, here's, come, get closer, come in. And before I knew it, I was almost center of the group. And, and it was uh, very powerful for me, uh, uh, both emotionally and spiritually. So, so I think different people, well, to go back to your question, I think different people reacted differently to cameras. Um, where you saw a majority of the images, it was a park called Clement Park in Littleton, Colorado, which is very uh, nearby to the high school. Actually, students parked uh, their cars and then would walk to the high school. And, and I think not only did, did Littleton, but Denver, uh, Colorado, all over the country, people came. Uh, by the thousands to, to lay flowers, to, to share um, their thoughts and, and prayers and emotions. And, and unfortunately, I think in the end, it, it, with some national media came in, some international media came in, I think in the end it, it started to be too much. And I think in that's, when that, when that began to, to, I think, be more relevant, I think that's when that sort of scene died down. Getting consent, getting consent. Um, when I make an image, um, and I can only basically speak for myself, I mean, I try to be as inconspicuous as possible, which is kind of hard for me because I'm sort of clumsy and big and loud. Um, but I, I, honestly, I try to make images that, um, that I don't have a, a hand in. In other words, if I see somebody reacting to something, I'll make an image and I'll go up after um, that scenario has, has changed or ended um, and ask, can I get your name? I'm, I'm, my name, I introduced myself. My name is Rudolph Gondolas. I'm with the Rocky Mountain News. Um, I took a picture. Uh, we're here covering Clement Park. Do you, do you mind if, if I get your name or if we use a photo? And uh, I think 9.9 .9 times out of 10, um, they're very grateful to give me their names. And that point 10, that, that point of the public that didn't want their names weren't upset. They just decided, you know what, I mean, you can use the picture, but I, I, don't, I don't need or want the recognition for being here. So, but I think every photographer, you know, had different reactions and every photographer uh, interacted differently. Student goes first. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. <laughs> They're paying.
Okay. Well, there's only two that's a yes or no question. Oh, sorry. <laughs> You know what? I think almost ninety-nine percent of them were. I, 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 to be honest with, to be honest with you, I, I was looking at them, and, and I've seen them so much that it's it's hard for me to remember whether they were published or not. But I think a lot of them, I'd like to say, almost all of them were published. But it was a composite of many photographers' work. Or, or those correct. Those correct. No. 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 The images that you that you saw were a composite of. Of the 15 photographers, um, they they covered uh, the 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 scene over the past year, and obviously you notice that not all the images were taken with that day or within the first few days. Some of the images were in recovery, um, trying to get back into norm, normal normalcy, I guess, of life, um, and it's been really challenging, not just for them but for us. Go ahead. Were there some photographs that were um, too graphic? Well, there's there's a lot of photographs that I thought personally were too graphic, for me, personally as a photojournalist. I mean, I kind of like, well, wait a minute, you know. And I was usually I was usually always pretty liberal and, and fought for images for their their impact and their power and the, the power to uh, stir emotions. And that's sort of what I do, and that's what I'd like to do. Um, but yeah, th th I mean, there was I thought was pretty dramatic images on there and they were published as well I think the I think to, to do anything but publish some of those images um, would have done the story uh, would have done the community and I think uh, the victims injustice and, and it's taken me a long time to to admit that I mean I'm sorry with that many photographers when it first happened uh, is there, was there any sense of strategy about how people deploy to, to cover it, or is it random? Or no, it's chaos. Uh, unfortunately, I, I wish I could say that, that we had, uh, I mean, you know, I say chaos, but in reality, I, I think there, I mean, what we did was um, we tried, as, as we learned, as the story unfolded and as we learned the severity, I mean, we just sent as many people as we could to the different locations. And, and if, if I arrived somewhere and I saw um, another photographer there that I worked with, I made it a point to say, hey, you okay, okay, you're fine, um, you have this, I'll go somewhere else. And, and sort of just strategize that way so that, you know, we could cover as much thing, as many things as possible. Go ahead. What kind of reactions did you get to photographs from the people who were involved? Um, there have been a lot of mixed reactions, to be honest with you. Um, I made one of the more graphic images uh, that day from a helicopter. Um, this was a photograph taken of uh, Daniel Robal. He was a 15-year-old freshman. Uh, he was on his way out of the cafeteria with a soda pop can, and he was allegedly one of the first victims shot by Harris and Klebel. He was the, uh, the young man that was laying on the sidewalk uh, I'm sure. Um, with with the other students sort of cowering behind a car with an officer offering some sort of uh, protection. Um, from the helicopter, I mean, with, with a long lens, um, it was pretty difficult to, to sort of, uh, you know, figure out what it is I was seeing and, and what it is I saw. Now, I, I don't want to make that sound like any kind of excuse, um, but at the same time, you know, as, as we're in a helicopter passing over and over, you know, at first, you know, I told a pilot in the helicopter, I think there's somebody laying, you know, I think there's a victim on the sidewalk. You know, and that's the adrenaline talking. And as I focus, hey, how are you? Um, as I focused and as, as we circled in another pattern, I came back and, and I couldn't believe it, but my mind, you know, and myself, I'm telling myself, no, no, that can't be it. That's not true. That's got to be, it looks like book bags. Yeah, that's what it is. And, and I was telling myself, I was lying to myself, basically. And, and you know, like I said, it's, it's taken a long time to, to, to come to these conclusions. But, um, I mean, yeah, the, there were a lot of images that I made and other photographers made that, that stirred incredible reactions, um, especially the next day. That image was published the next morning in the morning paper. 
and Daniel's mother, Sue, Robo, uh, Sue Patron, pardon me. Um, that's, that's how she found out her son was uh, a victim. I mean, she, she, she did not know. Um, a, a lot of people didn't know. There's a lot of missing students. Um, the law enforcement agencies um, could not go in and s identify bodies because of uh, the booby traps uh, feared left by Cleveland and Harris. So it wasn't until that morning, uh, after obviously incredible uh, agonizing uh, you know, time for that family, not hearing, not knowing, uh, praying and hoping for the best, but it was that next morning that they were able, she recognized her son right away, and she knew. And she was, I mean, it, it wasn't until days later when we, when we spoke with her, um, as I say spoke we, the, the newspaper spoke with her, it wasn't until days later that, okay, we realized the father was just outraged. And then, but the mother was, uh, found comfort and peace of mind. She knew where her son was. And she knew that her, her son died instantly, quickly and peacefully, didn't suffer. And she carried that, that clipping in the newspaper for <coughs> quite a while. As, I guess, I don't know, hopefully as a reference point or, or as, as a way of, or something to gather strength from. I don't know. I haven't had the, the courage yet to speak to her, but I'm working on it. Um, so yeah, there was a lot of graphic I images and there was a lot of outrage and there's a lot of, but I think that the outrage, I think there was less outrage, to be honest with you, than there, than there were um, just, just shock and, and emotion. You find yourself uh, in situations like Columbine or any other disaster competing with a television camera? No. That would be competing with my brother. <laughs> uh, the reason I asked is you had an angle. Uh, I remember seeing on CNN the guy throwing his sled over the, uh, when he was trying to get out the window. Patrick Ireland. And, he, uh, there was an image that, that was in the slideshow that was basically from the same angle, but there was nobody in the window. Yeah, I mean. As, as I mean, w when I was in the helicopter uh, in a pattern, there was a pattern of eight other helicopters and planes, all TV. I think I was the only still photographer up in a helicopter at the time. And to be honest with you, I, you know, I think we, by the time Patrick Ireland escaped and or actually was rescued, um, we had to head back to the airport to refuel. And so I, I didn't make an image of that. But yeah, I mean, you know, the, to rea the reality is newspapers compete with, with TV stations all the time. Um, it, it, you find yourself bumping other cameras to get a better angle for, for shot? Well, in, in, in certain scenarios, in certain scenarios, I mean, I think, uh, yeah, we all, we all compete in certain scenarios, in certain uh, proximities. I mean, can you imagine moving this guy out of the way? Uh, <laughs> Well, and vice versa, um, but I mean, at the same time, I mean, I think I think there is competitive nature between TV and stills. Uh, I, th I think they're two they're two solely two different mediums. So his shot that he needs for video and my shot I need for st stills is completely different. Um, and, and again, in my market, I know there's a lot the professional photographers and photojournalists in my market, video and still, we work very well together. And and, and although we're comp Although we're competitive, I mean, this, this industry is, is too small. This, this industry is, is too um, self-serving for individual photographers to uh, be cutthroat about it. It's, just, it, it's too small, and, and it, it will come back to you. Go ahead. Am I correct in some clarification? Did you say at one point in time that you felt like you didn't want to be connected to your work at Columbine? Yes, and that's correct. That? Well, I, I just don't, I mean, I... I I've been a photojournalist on the staff of the newspaper for the past 10 years, and, and I think you know, some of my favorite work came as a student here at SAC. And, and, and that's not just stuff that was published. I mean, and, and also had some of my favorite work as a, a member of the San Antonio Light staff. You know, that, and that, that comes not from awards, but coming from people I met, coming from the images I, I was able to make and who I learned from uh, and how I learned it. I mean, this this type of event and this kind of award um, is very, I mean, the award is very prestigious, please. I mean, it is something that as students and as journalists, we all at one time dream of winning the Pulitzer in one way or another. 
Um, but personally, I, you know, the, the, the word Columbine for a long time, I, and I say this after several sessions of therapy, would strike fear in me. You know, it's very paralyzing because it was something that, not that I didn't want to be associated with, but just something that I was trying to um, block out, get past, you know, bury, shove, hide, do whatever I could to not think about. And at the time when I, when I saw Irene last summer, I mean, that was, you know, one of those times in my, uh, I guess, biggest attempt of denial. But, I mean, I, I'm very, pr I, I tell you what, I am uh, incredibly proud to have worked with the photographers that I have worked in the 10 years that I've been a photojournalist. And, and the staff at the Rocky Mountain News is, is equal to any of the other staffs I've worked with, um, almost. So. Uh, but, but again, I mean, my fear is, is I, I want to be remembered, I mean, I'd like to be remembered um, for, I mean, other images as well, not just, you know, death and uh, grief. Go ahead. Um, I imagine it's going to be a long process, but what are some of the things that all the other people on the staff can paper with, sort of digest the experience and get behind you? Uh, so I think it would probably be the next emotion that you accepted the future Yeah. Well, I tell you what, I mean, you know, I, I hate to use the cliche of bittersweet, but I, I kind of, as a photojournalist, sort of lost words um, to explain any other kind of, of way to accept that. I mean, you know, you know, I, when I fantasize about winning the Pulitzer, I, I envisioned champagne, I envisioned hugs, I envisioned pats on the back, um, and, and a lot of, and you see that in other newsrooms all over the country. Um, you know, Washington Post won feature photography for the coverage of Kosovo refugees, and they were happy. Unfor you know, fortunately for them, Kosovo isn't in their backyard, and it isn't the story they're still covering. Um, uh, for us, in Denver, uh, and Littleton is, you know, I think just a suburb of Denver, I mean, it's that close. For us, it was an ongoing story. It still is an ongoing story. And, and, and there was, there, believe me, there was no champagne. There was, there was um, a lot of tears. Uh, I wish they would have been tears of joy. And, and uh, like I said, other people celebrated with champagne. I mean, we, we specifically decided, I mean, it was a moment of silence that, that we shared with each other and remembering what we covered and, and